Kieran. My name is Kieran, and I'm here to talk to you all about, um, well, data and analytics, you know, and, at, at speed and at high growth. Uh, optimally both, uh, you know, it'd be kind of strange if you're just doing uh, high growth and slow speed, you're probably not gonna, you know, stay in business for very long, and, and vice versa is also strange. But um, just, to, uh, just to give you guys a quick introduction, um, of, of, of myself, my background, and uh, you know, kind of why I'm standing here today. Uh, I figured I'll just sort of walk through uh, this, this very basic uh, map. Uh, so I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, it's where I you know, uh, went to school, uh, went to college, Vanderbilt University. I'm assuming there's no actual uh, Doors alumni here, but um, it's also where I joined my very first company. It was a startup in the financial analytics space. Uh, it's called New Constructs. Um, I, uh, I learned a lot of you know, early career life lessons uh, at New Constructs. Uh, number one is that uh, not every startup actually succeeds. Uh, it takes a whole lot of luck, uh, leadership, as well as you know, empowered decision making across uh, the company. Um, you know, I, I was told, it's kind of crazy, but I was told by uh, the CEO who hired me at the time that um, you know, this thing was, was going to be disruptive, it was going to be huge, we were all going to be driving Maseratis in the next, you know, six months, and, and I believed him, you know, I was a, uh, you know, I, I was a, what, 22-year-old, you know, coming out of school, uh, fairly bright, you know, um, but, but had no idea what it meant to actually work in a business. Uh, so, learned very quickly, uh, you know, very few of us would ever end up driving a Maserati, uh, ever, um, never mind, you know, working with that company. Um, and then the second thing I, I learned was that uh, data was becoming very valuable. I mean, this was over a decade ago, and um, this was uh, a business that, um, you know, whose whole intent was to leverage data uh, to turn financial analytics on its head. It was, a, it was a great idea, a grand vision. Unfortunately, it just, you know, didn't, didn't meet expectations. Uh, so after a short stint in, uh, in grad school, decided to make it all the way out west. Uh, to sunny San Diego, uh, to a company called Provide Commerce, uh, whose flagship site was uh, proflowers.com. So proflowers.com, early e-commerce company uh, that you know specialized in getting flowers directly from the growers uh, all the way to the consumers. So cutting out the middleman. Uh, it's, it's kind of a predecessor to the Warby Parkers and the Bonoboses and and uh, you know kind of all of those other similar companies that are that are emerging today. Uh, so at ProFlowers, learned a whole lot about e-commerce, all the way from fulfillment to customer service uh, to marketing uh, and so on. Worked with a lot of very intelligent people. Uh, one of them being a gentleman by the name of Dave Atchison, who, um, who uh, a few years later uh, called me up and uh, you know, convinced me that uh, a small startup uh, in Seattle that he, uh, he was heading up marketing for might actually, you know, be a legitimate business. So, fly out there, interview, talk to the leadership. I'm very impressed, and so I give up uh, all the San Diego sun for, you know, just Seattle rain and darkness uh, to work at a, uh, you know, nine-month-old startup uh, called Zululi that specialized in baby clothes, uh, or so I thought at the time. Uh, it's, it's actually a much more uh, complex and interesting business than that. Uh, and then in the last two months, I um, decided, you know what? Uh, I want to try this one more time. So Zulu ended up, you know, becoming very successful, rapidly growing company. We IPO'd in uh, November, and um, I decided, you know what, I'm probably going to only have, you know, so much more energy to uh, try this thing again. See if see if I can be a part of a, another amazing story. Uh, and so I moved to a company called Porch. And what Porch does is we are aiming to make home improvement um, just an easier and better process uh, for consumers, as well as for professionals. And so, um, uh, yeah, we're working on defining that, building it out, building a great platform. We had a great team up there. Um, and so that's, that's my shameless promotion of, of Porch. So uh, my main goal here, actually, is to, uh, is to talk about my experiences at Zulily, but uh, from the perspective of, uh, of an analytics um, uh, kind of, you know, person or analytics lead, uh, what I ended up doing there is starting the analytics practice from the ground up into pretty much what it was three months or so ago, and uh, and yeah, growing it, uh, helping you know our company 
build the framework for making decisions, helping build the underlying data architecture uh, in terms of a product management perspective, and uh, you know, trying, to, trying to keep up with the rapid growth and, and the success that the company experienced. So uh, the first place I'd like to start is the core tenets of the company. So if you talk to Zuli's um, you know, HR team today, they probably have a huge booklet of all of the you know, different you know, items that are in the mission statement today, all the things that we care about. But from the very beginning, there are really only two main tenets. Uh, one was customer focus. And so customer focus wasn't just uh, you know, intended for the marketing and the customer service teams. It was intended for people across the entire company. Um, so I remember a very good story with regards to Daryl, our CEO, and our first attempts at building a recommendations engine. Uh, this was super basic. It's not anywhere close to uh, what, what Zuli has today. But, um, but uh, you know, we were really proud of it at the time. So. Uh, we build this recommendations engine, and it's showing you know all of these different customers, these different uh, sorts of all of the different sales that we have, and um, you know, overall on average, the the math seemed to indicate that um, we were driving more sales, we were driving you know overall better margins for the company. Uh, but Daryl, uh, obsessive about the customer as he is, um, demanded that you know he see visible proof because he didn't believe that the average um, you know, customer spending a little more money in some short period of time was, was necessarily the direction that we wanted the company to go into. Um, so he demanded, you know what? For every single one of these uh, clusters of people that are getting all of these different sorts across our site, uh, I want to see every day the homepage for every one of them. And I want us to walk through every one of those. For the next, you know, however long, it doesn't even matter. We might go three months. You're going to be printing out the homepage for every one of these folks, and we're going to go through all of it. So that's how, you know, extreme a focus uh, we had as a company when it came to the customer experience. Um, and I know they're still very obsessive about it today. Uh, there's there's many things that a four-year-old company, you know, is bound to do wrong. And um, you know the, the great thing about the leadership of that company is that they're constantly focused on on making it better as fast as possible. Which leads me to the second core tenant, which is speed. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of people that take the concept of you know failing fast in, in completely the wrong direction. Um, you know, which is just hey, let's just be reckless. Let's just throw stuff up there and just not care at all. Uh, Zuli Way was more about failing fast in in spirit. So it's it's really constantly making those measured trade-offs around. You know, what is the true cost if we end up screwing this up, if we end up throwing a bad experience or building a bad, uh, you know, data model or data architecture? Um, what happens? What do we really lose? Um, and if it's not much, then go for it. Uh, if it is much, let's see if we can find a creative way uh, to move faster without incurring that same cost. Um, and so uh, as, as I have up here on the slides, you know, failing fast, or not failing fast, but just moving fast, uh, forces you to make the decisions of what's actually important on a daily basis uh, and what's not. Um, when your back's up against the wall, you're forced to create efficiencies that you otherwise just wouldn't have thought about. Uh, and moving fast kind of constantly puts you in that position. And the last thing is you can't bottleneck yourself. Uh, a lot of the people here, I'm assuming, are, are you know data and, and analytics folks. And um, it's very easy to become a bottleneck. Um, you know, you're, you're the person uh, or, or you're the group that people are constantly coming for asking uh, to pull a report or to run an analysis or do this, to do that. And uh, at some point, because you're the only person that can do it and everyone's relying on you, you're, you're proving your worth, um, you become a bottleneck. You prevent growth, whether you see it and other people see it or not. Uh, at a company like Zuli, where you know, our goal was to move uh, you know, faster than light speed, um, those pain points were going to become visible very quickly. And so you had to make sure that uh, you can empower the people around you um, as quickly as possible so as not to become that bottleneck. Um, be it you know, ensuring that everyone in the company knows how to write SQL or to ensure that you're you know, getting the right tools in place to, you know, to 
make it possible for them to get at what they want themselves, and so on. So um, one other thing I forgot to mention, by the way, so I've, I've been doing a lot of talking. I've talked about myself as well as uh, Zuli's core tenets. But um, please feel free to raise your hand and, and ask questions along the way uh, in typical startup fashion uh, with both Porch and Zuli. You know, I threw up uh, some fairly bare bones slides with uh, you know, high level concepts about uh, the things I learned you know, at Zuli and how we you know, ran the company. But um, feel free to interrupt along the way, ask whatever questions you want. Uh, I'm happy to go as, as wide or as deep as, uh, as you guys want to take me. All right. Yes. No, that's a that's a very good question, and, and we dealt with it um, we dealt with it a lot at Zulily. So uh, what I ended up doing honestly was was holding holding classes and, and just teaching people SQL. Uh, the truth is, when um, and not everyone here is that you know a rapidly growing uh, startup, but uh, I don't believe that those principles can't be adopted uh, elsewhere. Um, people had to work long hours and they had to work very hard uh, to produce something that um, their customers you know, love. And uh, what that meant is, hey, if we need to take an extra hour out of work, I'm willing to take that time to teach you. Uh, I'm willing to do it on a weekly basis. Uh, let's figure out how to get you to be able to do just the basic stuff. Um, the truth is, I wasn't going to teach people to become, you know, huge data experts where they're, you know, running Hive queries and, you know, um, you know, on, on on some Hadoop framework and and whatnot. But I could teach them to do the 30 to 40 percent um, that they were going to be using regularly, anyways, is a critical process. And uh, that way, I just stopped being the bottleneck over time, uh, and they felt empowered. I mean, the truth is, I think anyone that has done anything technically on their own. Um, the first few times that you actually accomplish something, it's the greatest feeling in the world. So it's really about trying to get those people to experience that just once or twice, at which point they're working at home, VPNing into the system and just running things left and right and coming in with all the cool things that they learned. And uh, at that point, it's your job just to get out of the way, don't feel weird that all of a sudden they're empowered to do things on their own. Feel empowered that you can now chase the cool things that you want to chase. Um, with regards to Zulia, I mean, we constantly had more things from a strategic perspective that uh, we were then able to answer, right? Um, you know, like I said, you're going from supply chain to customer service to merchandising to, um, to marketing. And so, you know, being able to holistically understand all aspects of that business and starting to drive strategy uh, outward rather than just being this this pull organization that's just forced to produce stuff for people uh, and not being able to use your brain, right, and, and show your talents uh, is, is um, we viewed that as a negative thing. So empowering people was always the, the direction that we aimed for. Um, later on in the later, you know, last year or so, we uh, greatly started um, focusing on rolling out more self-service tools like the Tableau uh, type tools where um, it allowed people to easily get at that stuff themselves. Um, the challenge in doing that too early is that those tools are only as good as your underlying data. So um, we, uh, we were very careful as to the rate that we did that rollout. So um, this is one of my favorite uh, quotes. Uh, I don't remember who said it or how it emerged, but uh, it's a fairly common one uh, in the marketing organization at Zulily. Um, and, and the thing is, you, you just can't build a perfect house. Uh, so I have a bunch of random pictures here. I'm assuming no one can actually tell uh, what I meant to do uh, with, with these pictures. But the basic concept is, you know, imagine yourself uh, at, at you know, 23, 24 years old. You know, you're starting to make a regular salary, and, and uh, you know, you're, you're working hard, you're doing well, and you, know, you want to buy your own, your own place. Um, so what are the things you actually start valuing when you're looking to, to you know, buy into a place that's you know, getting built? Uh, you might want it to be in the city, 
uh, near a lot of the you know clubs or restaurants or, or whatever it is you care about. Uh, you want it to be fairly modern, right? Um, you don't want some just old place when you're bringing your friends over and, and it's just beat up and, and embarrassing. So, um, so you know, you, you imagine something like this. It's like super modern. There's, you know, it's a giant loft. You know, there's stairs going up to your room and so on. Well, the thing is, by the time this thing gets built, let's say it's, you know, anywhere from one to three years later, um, let's say you met someone and you've, you've kind of started getting into the groove. You're, you're past the honeymoon phase. You're, you know, you, you're, you're ready to nest. Um, by the time this thing is done actually being built, um, you're ready for, for something a little more cozy, right? Uh, your Saturday nights are a little bit less of, you know, going out clubbing or raving or whatever, you know, young people do these days. And, um, and hanging out, sitting on the couch, you know, watching, turn on Netflix, you know, watching something, maybe having a fireplace, um, and, and just cozying up. Um, so maybe, you know, your perfect house is now um, building or buying a townhouse, you know, um, slightly outside of the, the center of the city, you know, let's say if, if you live in Seattle, maybe like a Ballard or, or uh, you know, a place like that. Um, by the time you actually build that place, let's say you've gotten married, let's say you have a kid, uh, your house is, you know, no longer perfect. You have a new perfect house. It's got to be safe. Uh, it's got to be large. Uh, it's got to be something that, you know, um, you can manage to, that you can have a private space in. Like, let's say you, you might actually want a little bit of an office so that, you know, little kids running around aren't, aren't you know, um, constantly in your face as you're trying to get work done. Or maybe, you know, uh, that is what you want. So, you know, you're constantly changing your definition of a perfect house. It doesn't mean that the house itself was not a great product. Um, it just means that you shouldn't spend too much time um, envisioning the perfect tool or architecture or schemas um, because by the time you will have built it, the needs of your company or your organization will likely have changed if your organization is growing um, or succeeding. So, um, so always keep that in focus. Um, you know, determine how can you keep the size of your project and the scope of your project uh, smaller such that you can iterate to a better solution over time. So a uh, very basic example, or not so basic actually, uh, was a project that you know, we ended up undertaking at uh, Provide Commerce, ProFlowers. And uh, the concept of this project um, was essentially to start pulling in data uh, on our costs from all of our fulfillment centers, um, from the growers, uh, and you know, from our outbound shipping. We wanted to be able to say, for any given action on our website, what was the true margin impact? It was a grand undertaking, and uh, you know, um, it was a great idea. Uh, imagine you don't have to guess and, and you know, make a lot of swag estimates uh, as to you know, what the impact of something is from a margin perspective. The problem was that uh, we decided to spend a whole lot of time planning and getting you know, the, the perfect overall architecture to start pulling in this cost data. Um, countless meetings, over a year of planning, and by the time I had left, you know, Provide Commerce, uh, we hadn't really even started on the project because every time we were kind of ready, uh, there were new edge cases that we had to solve for um, because the company was growing. And you know, all of a sudden now it's well, how do we deal with drop shippers and getting their data? How do we deal with, you know, just all of these like one-offs? Uh, what happens if there's a um, you know, cancellation driven by the grower versus a cancellation driven by our consumer and so on and so forth. And uh, it was a lot of, you know, long, boring meetings trying to figure out these tiny, you know, 1% cases uh, when we could have just built this thing and, uh, you know, dealt with those edge cases later. So what we commonly do at Zulily is, uh, or did, I'm no longer there, but uh, what we commonly did at Zulily was uh, focus around use cases. And so um, a use case could be, hey, uh, the marketing organization with regards to acquisition marketing uh, wants to be able to understand, you know, first of all, how many people are we getting uh, from a given channel, keyword, campaign, ad group, whatnot, and how many of those people are converting into uh, active or paying customers. Um, we didn't need to build out a huge schema to be able to solve for everything in the customer lifecycle. 
um, we built out something to solve for the most important problem, and that was that specific use case. Um, another example might be, hey, what SKUs uh, are we selling out of the most out of the product lines that our you know, vendors are sending us? Um, you know, as I mentioned, Zuli deals in baby clothes. Um, a lot of our vendors end up sending us these giant prepacks, which are um, basically full size lines of, of clothes. So if you want to buy a, you know, size three for a toddler, you may also end up having to purchase a, you know, size seven for a preteen. So what we want to know is, well, when we're buying all of that and having to break them up and sell them individually to a customer, how much extra waste are we taking on? Um, that's a specific use case. And so we, uh, we spent a lot more time solving for those use cases. And because we moved fast, as I mentioned, um, we were quickly able to determine when those kind of one-off use case fixes uh, became bottlenecks and when we needed to build something more sophisticated. Um, and then we were, able to fo we were able to focus on that as the most important thing. Um, so we were constantly adjusting and measuring our trade-offs uh, on an ongoing basis. It allowed our company to build a lot of things that uh, added a lot of value to people very, very early on and uh, much more quickly than most other organizations. Um, and hence, you know, four years later, uh, we, we uh, grew to, you know, almost 700 million in, in revenue and, uh, and IPO'd. And a lot of that was because of all of those small little decisions that we were able to make in that first year of being in existence. Any questions? Okay. So I probably could have used a better metaphor than, than sandcastles, but um, uh, it's kind of what came to mind and it fit within my overall scheme here. But, um, you know, when, when, you have, uh, when you have a plan to build, um, let's say, a house or a building or, or whatever it is, um, you know, you might hire an architect, and that architect's going to end up building um, you know, a bunch of uh, designs as well as, you know, probably a model. And, um, and they're going to give you an idea of how uh, that building is going to look within its, you know, kind of overall um, environment uh, before you actually undertake the project. Uh, when it comes to data models, um, you know, that's kind of a, intended to be a similar purpose, right? You're able to understand how all of these um, uh, the schema that you're building out, um, how all the you know, tables or, or data sets within the, the schema uh, relate to one another and uh, how it's intended to work. The problem is you don't actually get to experience you know, how it works until you've built it. Um, what that means is that by the time you've built it, the people that start actually pulling data from it um, may end up finding a lot of issues that end up having to be you know, fixed after the fact. And so now you start having another bottleneck of an issue as you're building out all this stuff. So um, the, the concept I want to speak of here is how do we come up with a sandcastle or a model or something of that nature that people can actually use, um, provide feedback to the end product such that you don't end up building something that is going to be a massive undertaking to fix. So what we ended up doing uh, you know, at Zuli is make it very, very easy uh, for analysts to, um, to just sort of hack away at things um, and, and produce uh, derivative data sets that, um, that you know, they could just sort of burn and build over time. Um, you know, obviously, be it BI developers, platform engineers, whatever, uh, anyone who's uh, working here in Seattle. Uh, probably knows that um, it's very difficult to to find and, and hire and, and retain those folks. So, um, you know, that's not necessarily true of uh, of, of of hacks. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that that can be a hack. Uh, you you know, analysts actually play that role oftentimes in many uh, organizations. But um, you know, this day and age, there's almost no reason that everyone in an organization shouldn't have an ability to know, you know, some basic SQL and, let's say, you know, Excel skills. So, um, yeah, you know, bring in, bring in more hacks and, uh, you know, enable those hacks to, or people willing to be hacks and enable those people to uh, actually start building um, derivative data sets for 
for their own use. What ends up happening from those derivative data sets is you start learning how the business is actually asking questions. And so this is something that's very common at Zuli, um, especially within marketing, but really across the entire organization. Uh, we were constantly getting in trouble by you know, the, the DevOps folks and the, the BI uh, you know, uh, leads because we were just taking up more and more space you know, on, on a lot of our uh, servers. But uh, those people never got too mad because they realized that if that got taken away, um, basically they would have a line you know, all the way around the floor and outside the building just constantly asking them to do stuff and build stuff. And they were just going to be stressed and constantly feeling like they weren't able to accomplish enough for the business. Uh, so this actually allowed the analytics team, as well as like, the playing team in Merch, as well as a lot of other organizations uh, throughout the company to just build their own stuff. And um, you know, the only challenge was to maintain the discipline to uh, destroy those data sets that were no longer being, in, being used. Um, so this was a pretty, pretty huge value add for us, uh, just making sure we could build things, um, making sure that we were able to build requirements based on actual use cases and experience rather than having to envision something that we were going to end up having to fix anyways um, in the future. So the um, next thing I you know, want to talk about is, uh, so as, as you grow and as your data grows and as your organization grows and the complexity of the business grows, um, where it's no longer just, hey, you know, I'm selling you a, a dress and I'm going to call my vendor and they're going to ship me a dress and, um, you know, that's that. Uh, you, you have to be able to adjust um, what you have built in the past um, in order to support that greater complexity. Uh, what that means is you can't just, can't just say, hey, we built this thing, we're going to band-aid around it and constantly try to build something um, of increasing complexity. It's harder to manage, harder to query, and harder to work with. Um, so at Zulily, a great example of this was, uh, or you know, there's many great examples, but we built a lot of our data sets you know, kind of from a marketing perspective around the life cycle of the customer. Um, because as I mentioned, you know, that's one of the core tenets of, of, the, of the business. Um, what that meant is it eventually became very, very difficult for the merchandising team to easily get at the data that they needed. So um, if, uh, you know, for anyone that's fairly unfamiliar with, with the business model of Zulily, um, we didn't actually own the inventory that we sold until after a customer had already purchased it. Um, what that means is we actually had the ability, if our vendor was willing, to add or remove inventory uh, that was available to sell, you know, kind of on the fly. We were able to do that, you know, whenever we wanted. Um, for a merchant, that's very difficult to, or a planner, it's very difficult to be able to, um, you know, actually do any sort of analysis because one minute at the very beginning of your sale or your event, you could have had 5,000 units available to sell, and selling 1,000 of those means you sold through 20% of what was available. Um, but if you just cut 3,000 units of inventory, um, you know, how do you actually count that? Did you sell 50% of what was available you know, um, as of five minutes ago, even though some of the sales happened before you cut the inventory? Like, what actually happened? And so um, we had to be willing to essentially rip out uh, the data sets that you know, merchant planning relied upon and uh, build something that was able to handle that specific use case. Um, so the big, you know, point here is as you're going, growing, um, be willing to you know, tear down uh, what you've already built. Don't be afraid to you know, kind of start from scratch with new use cases um, and new overall data models. A uh, big piece of doing that is you know, essentially generating um, user feedback. So as I mentioned um, before, when you're initially building out some of these data sets, uh, using the data built out by hacks uh, is very key in being able to define and, and, and write out the requirements for, um, for your end state data. Well, the same is true of your next generation and the generation after that. 
you know, you need to know when you're starting to hit legitimate pain points in your business of your existing data sets. And at the point that um, those data sets no longer kind of fit your needs or start slowing down the business enough uh, such that you're actually limiting growth, tear it down. Like, what do you really lose? Uh, I mean, I don't mean actually tear it down before you've built up the replacement, but you know, uh, what, what, do you, what do you really lose um, from switching to something new? Um, the big challenge oftentimes is in those specific situations, uh, convincing the business that that is the right course of action to take. But um, if you start out with that mindset where everyone agrees that, hey, every few years we're likely going to have to um, start fresh, um, you know, you sometimes take the, take the edge off of those conversations. All right, so this is my, uh, you know, my conclusion. Uh, basic concept is when you move fast and you know, you're, you're constantly driven to uh, you know, stay accelerated, it uh, allows you to create um, innovation internally that you otherwise wouldn't have. Your back is up against the wall and uh, it helps in a lot of different ways. It's not just you know, working harder and more driving growth, it's working harder drives innovation it actually compounds that growth. Um, yeah, don't over-engineer. Uh, I think you know, everyone fairly uh, agrees with that in concept, but um, what I actually encourage everyone to do is under-engineer. Um, make it easy for people who aren't engineers to build um, the right requirements for you. Um, give more people power, as I mentioned before. We, we kind of spoke to that. And uh, the last thing is, yeah, don't be married to what you've already built. Obviously, we all take great pride in uh, some of the solutions we've built, but uh, if it's really doing its job, then it's eventually going to become obsolete. Um, either that or some really critical baseline process that uh, you can't rely upon to drive outperformance or great growth. So um, that's uh, essentially what I got. Um, anyone have any questions you know, specifically about my experience at Zululi, any stories you'd like to hear, um, anything you know, more deeply technical than, than what I've spoken to um, you know, up to this point. Uh, well, it, it depends on, on what you consider an uphill battle and, and, and what you know, you're willing to do from a skill sets perspective. So uh, one thing that I've learned is that you're always going to um, come up against people that are afraid of change, right? Um, from my experience, if you're willing to put in the time and the effort to actually build, even if it's a you know, really half-assed version of, of what you envision, Right, um, and you actually give them the physical experience of having seen you know what you've produced. Uh, it's super easy to to convince someone. Honestly, uh, it's the same thing. You know, at, uh, if you look at our customers, um, because of the very low price of our product, um, a lot of our vendors are very afraid to have have what uh, those prices are be visible to the public. So we actually had to have a sign-in wall from the very beginning. And uh, sign-in walls aren't very popular among you know, most companies because they drive conversion down. And uh, the truth is we had tons of people visiting our site and saying, hey, we don't ever want to uh, ever shop with you ever again. Like this is the worst thing ever. Why would I ever you know, want a sign-in wall? Few that decided to do it anyways, um, the moment that they actually received delivery of the product or had a chance to actually speak with our customer service agent, um, everything changed. They turned into some of the most adoring, you know, obsessive uh, customers any company's ever had. And you know, we kept supporting that. Um, the same actually happened oftentimes inside our organization. Um, there's certain groups that do move very slow. Uh, for example, you know, um, and, and 
actually, this isn't the best way to put it, but uh, slow is not actually what, what I uh, wanted to say. But um, within our company, you know, marketing and tech, we're obviously going to be more uh, technologically savvy, right? But you have organizations like, let's say, merchandising, where um, those people are damn good at finding opportunities and convincing vendors to get on our platform. But they're not all able to you know, get into data or Excel or any of that stuff. Um, I mean, we had people that still had actual like, you know, like Rolodex, right? And, and that's how they communicate with people. And that's, you know, they wrote everything down in their notebooks. Um, so, you know, it really took a lot of showing them even, even a vision of the future uh, with a working prototype uh, to convince them that, you know, this was the direction we wanted to go. I mean, and today it's one of the best commercial organizations of, you know, in Seattle from my perspective. So, um, what I encourage you to do is, uh, at least within your skill set or if you're willing to learn, um, produce something that people can actually touch and feel um, over time uh, that tends to make people more comfortable. I could be completely off base, though. Uh, cool. Did you have a? Sure. Uh, how do you take those ideas that seem to be sticky and move them into something that your operations side wants to live with forever? So maybe the hack fund, you know, takes an, you know, an hour every night to you know, suck in some new data, and the operations people are like, well, we only have 15 minutes, so we need to think of that. So how did that transition work? What's not uh, it, was, it was consistently and constantly painful. Um, so. Uh, the bad thing about producing a hacky solution is if it really does add value, if you have shown the prototype and people start using it, um, it can very quickly become a you know, critical part of the business. Uh, you know, so for example, uh, there, there are actually two hacks that, that we kind of produce on the fly and they're using SaaS. I don't know if many people here use SaaS. It's an awful, awful tool, but uh, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of people do use it. Um, hopefully. Um, but um, but uh, hopefully there's no reps here. I feel bad if I said anything. But but uh, it's a it's a very tough tool to uh, to use at the scale like a company like Thule needed. And um, so one of the hacks was like, hey, building a full fledged uh, you know member valuation algorithm is kind of driven off of uh, some some logistic regressions as well as like, a lot of classification work. And uh, the other was a prepax optimization algorithm. So it's uh, linear programming. I don't know if uh, anyone here is familiar with those. But we built these in SAS, and we had them producing data sets um, and you know, allowing people to, to see the data they needed to make a lot of decisions on a daily basis. Um, the problem is that as the company grew, the size of the data and the complexity of the data was constantly growing. And people, you know, if, if these things broke, um, what originally was a, was a hacky solution that didn't matter if it broke, um, became a critical element where the business was stopping, you know, if, if they broke. Um, it's about having a regular, constant conversation with, um, with tech. And, you know, if you have the right pro process in place such that, you know, they've provided you the power and the value um, to, to produce things that, uh, that make everyone's lives easier, um, they need to also provide you with uh, a way to make that stuff repeatable once it becomes critical. Um, but yeah, it's about having those conversations early on. That it's actually a very difficult problem to, uh, to solve. Um, that was part of my role as a lead, constantly you know, hammering on the table, saying, look, um, these things are now you know, clear priorities. Uh, and, you know, they're probably the most important data elements today, so let's operationalize it. Um, but, yeah, no, very good question.
Yeah. Well, if you actually want to move to a new stack, I mean, what I would say is uh, that's also fairly cheap if it's a young company. I mean, um, Hadoop probably is, uh, you know, kind of a reasonable direction to go. Um, what I would say is, you know, well, there's, there's kind of two things that I would say to this. One is, yes, not an uncommon problem. And, uh, you know, one of the best ways to try to solve that is, um, I don't know how big the company you're, you're referring to is, but or that you, that you work for is, but um, it's really finding champions outside of that organization uh, to to actually be those representatives in um, in in those meetings. Um, you know, politics is a strong word, but but having champions uh, in terms of end users uh, definitely helps um, because there are end users that actually know and feel and see the value of the data. Uh, a lot of technology organizations are going to move more slowly um, than, uh, than the business itself if, if they are left to do that, uh, just because you know, there, there's a whole risk mitigation aspect um, to, to that. So, um, but but uh, what I would also say is that you know, when you work with a technology organization, um, it's very common for people to uh, try to prescribe a solution. Um, and, you know, they're prescribing a solution from, I mean, it can be as far out here as being a hack to as far out here as having no freaking clue what you're talking about, right? Um, but you're trying to prescribe a solution to, to experts who, um, who they're scared for, for the right reasons. The, the thing is, you know, is it the right thing to act scared, you know, uh, in order to advance the business? And the answer is no. But um, working with them to understand the actual business problem oftentimes helps uh, without trying to convince them to actually do something. Uh, what tends to happen is those people will actually start looking into things themselves, doing some research. And you know, the moment that they actually prescribe to you the solution um, is the moment that you realize that they're, they're probably going to actually do it versus fight you on it. Um, but in terms of stack, yeah, I mean, uh, it really just depends on, on the type of data that you're talking about and, and what specifically. So, for example, if, if we're talking about site clickstream data that um, you know, is just going to continue growing uh, at a higher and higher rate as you increase the, um, the rate that you know, your existing members or users are interacting with your site, um, then yes, Hadoop, MapReduce, that probably makes sense as a near-term solution. Uh, if you're talking about you know, kind of heavy on the relationships uh, side of things where you know you're building a social network um, graph might be the way to go um, there's also just larger you know larger uh, other other technology stacks that you can potentially use just based on the specific problem that are either open source or free um, uh, or freemium I'm sorry uh, so it just sort of depends any other questions all right, well, it was great, uh, great talking to you all today. Um, my name is Karen once again. Feel free to reach out uh, to me at Karen at uh, porch.com if you have any additional questions that, that uh, come from this. Uh, it was great talking to you all. Thanks for the questions. <laughs>